Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to try and answer the question, why can't my brand new DJI Spark record 4K video? Now, I've gotten that question a lot from you guys over the last few weeks since this little guy was released, so I thought I'd sit down, talk about some of the technology and engineering behind this marvelous little quad that kind of limits its ability to record at 4K. But having said that, a lot of people are trying to compare the Mavic with the Spark, and they're frustrated that it can only record 1080p when the Mavic can record a full 4K. Honestly, in my opinion, the 1080p is, is good enough for most of the stuff that I record. I fly both of these quads on a regular basis. This is fast becoming my favorite quad for a lot of different reasons, and the resolution is not one of those that I trip over often. There are occasions where I need 4K, so I take the Mavic out and I'll use that, but they're not the majority of the stuff that I shoot. So when I go out for fun or I go out and do a job, Typically, 1080p is fine because when you move to a 4K image or 4K video, you've got a much larger file. It takes a lot longer to process. A lot of monitors can't even represent it well. So there are a lot of reasons why even if I record it in 4K, I may down res to 1080p during post. So having said all that, there are some limiting factors that are built into the Spark just by its design because it's smaller and its price point that sort of limits its ability to record anything higher than 4K. There's been a lot of speculation out there about why that is, so I thought I'd sit down. I kind of put my nerd hat on, did a lot of research, and I'm going to give you all the facts that I found for the reasoning behind the fact that it can't do 4K video. So I'll break this into a couple of different sections, but stay tuned and we'll get into it. The first thing I checked was the camera sensors in both quads to see if that was the limiting factor. Because obviously if the Mavic Pro's image sensor was dramatically different than the Sparks, they'd have different video recording capabilities. Now my first stop for that investigation was the DJI website where they give you a tremendous amount of information and technical detail on the imaging systems between these two quads. The challenge is if you go there and look at the Mavic specifications, and then flip over to the Spark page, you're gonna see those specs look very, very similar. It's not until you put them up side by side that you'll start to notice technical differences and subtle differences between them that are tantalizing clues as to what might be going on inside that Spark that limits its 4K recording capabilities. So what I'm gonna do now is put up a chart, show you the two side by side, and point out a couple of subtle differences between them that I think are interesting things to note that led me to my next uh, investigation. So if I look at both of the specs side by side, You'll notice right off that they both use the same image sensor. It's both a, a half point three CMOS sensor. The Mavic has got a 12.35 megapixel capacity, and the Spark is limited to 12 megapixels. Now that was an interesting clue to me, because I have to wonder, if you've got that sensor in there, why would you artificially limit the amount of megapixels that were available? So that had me thinking, and I checked that off. If I go down next to the lens where the field of view is shown, it isn't really going to affect the 4K recording, but I did find it interesting that the Mavic has got a 78.8 degree field of view, and the Spark's got a wider one at 81.9, I think it is. And all that means is that downfield, I've got a little wider vision with the Spark than I do with the Mavic. I just thought that was interesting. But if I drop down to the image size, that's an interesting clue. The Mavic has got an image size of 4,000 by 3,000, and the Spark has got a slightly smaller image size of 3,968 by 2976. Now if I do the math on that, both of those dimensions are reduced by about 1%, or actually 0.8%. And that's pretty consistent. So again, I've limited the megapixels I'm recording with the Spark. I've also limited the image size. Why would I do that, right? So the engineer in me kicks in. I've got a couple of tantalizing clues there that make me think they're doing something artificially to limit that size. The only reason you would limit that size is because you needed that extra space on the sensor for some type of image stabilization. So I'll get into that in the next set of slides. But then I started thinking, well, what sensor are they using in these two? Now, we don't really know for sure because they don't call out the sensor, but we all kind of suspect they're using Sony sensors in there, and they may even mention it in one of their press briefings. So I did a little investigation off the DJI site on the Sony site, trying to identify a sensor that would fit the bill. And I found, I think, the correct sensor for both of these quads, which is the same. It's an IMX 377 CQT, which is listed on the Sony site as a uh, type 1.5.3, 12.35 megapixel sensor. And what's interesting is, when I go down to the feature set, it shows it as completely capable of recording 4K and 2K at 60 frames per second. So between the two, what that means is, on the Mavic, they're using the full width and height of the sensor, but for some reason on the Spark, they're limiting that. So I have to say that the sensor is not the limiting factor, it's what they're doing with the sensor that limits the 4K. 
Now, why would you limit that? Why would you cut back on that sensor size? So let's get into the next clue. So once I realized that the Spark isn't using all of its sensor and that about 1% of it is being artificially reserved for some other function, I got to thinking. And I have a lot of free time on my hands. The conclusion I came to was the only reason I would reserve that really expensive real estate on that sensor was to enable some type of digital image stabilization. Now, a lot of quads do that, a lot of cameras do that. The technique is basically, whatever sensor you've got, you reserve a little bit of the outside ring, and as that camera gets moved around, I can digitally move that image around inside that sensor so I eliminate that shake or that rumble. Now, why would I need to do that here? Because I've got mechanical stabilization. Then I started thinking, yeah, but they're different. Right? The Mavic's got a three-axis gimbal stabilization system. This is a two-axis. So with the Mavic, I can compensate for roll, pitch, and yaw. So anything this quad does, that gimbal up front can compensate for that movement and you get butter smooth video, which means I can use the entire image sensor inside there because I'm compensating for all those movements up front through mechanical means. The Spark, on the other hand, has a two axis gimbal stabilization system, which means it can compensate for roll and it can compensate for pitch. It can't fix yaw. So if this thing's moving in the wind this way, there has to be something else keeping that image stable or your video is gonna start jerking like this. So when I looked on their website, I found one of the pages mentioned a technology called Ultra Smooth Technology. They do brag about it being a mechanically stabilized gimbal, and it is, but that third dimension has to be picked up by something. It can't be fixed by the gimbal. That Ultra Smooth Technology, in my opinion, is a digital image stabilization system inside the quad that'll compensate for that side-to-side -side movement or the yaw movement through a digital image stabilization technique. Now, having said that, they're not all the same. There's a lot of different ways you can anticipate and move that image around through digital image stabilization. They've done a tremendous job inside this quad because I've flown this thing in incredibly stiff winds and I've got a rock solid picture. The downside to using digital image stabilization is I can't use the full sensor. So even though I've got a 4K sensor inside the Spark, I can't use all of it. If I did use all of it, I'd have shaky video in this direction. So I've got to artificially limit it and minimize that, that image quality inside there, that image size inside there. Now, as I mentioned before, there's really two techniques for image stabilization. There's mechanical, and mechanical in this case is the gimbal. So the gimbals take responsibility for handling any kind of movement and stabilizing it out. This one can do it in three dimensions. This one can only do it in two dimensions. And then you get into the digital image stabilization. Now, with digital image stabilization on, on the Spark, what we've got is a 4K sensor with about 1% cropped in from the outside. And if you look at that, that Spark now has the ability to move that image side to side if it needs to. Or if there's really violent images in this direction or this direction that it can't compensate for, it's got a little extra room to play with moving it around inside that sensor. So what you've got, and, and it's a great technique, is you've got a fantastic two-axis gimbal stabilization system in here that's coupled with an algorithm for digital image stabilization developed by DJI that provides a fantastic picture. Now remember, DJI isn't new to this, right? They're, they're big into cameras, they're big into stabilizers, they've got the Osmo technology, they've built drones for a lot of years that have very sophisticated uh, image stabilization systems and gimbal stabilization systems. They've got algorithms running inside these quads that anticipate, through artificial intelligence, just reading the gyros and things, anticipate the movement and make the corrections in the gimbals pretty quickly. So you've got a fantastic two axis gimbal on the front. I believe adding that third dimension to the gimbal stabilization might have forced them to raise the price of this considerably. So to keep the price down a little bit, they've gone to a two axis gimbal. But in my opinion, I've flown this thing in incredibly stiff winds on really adverse days for weather, and it's been rock solid. So I don't see a problem with this. Even when I'm you know, spinning and turning and dropping, it's rock solid video. So for me, the combination of the two axis gimbal with that digital image stabilization uh, just provides a tremendously cool product. But again, don't think that all digital image stabilization systems are the same because there's a lot of quads out there that talk about having rock solid stable, stable video that's digitally enhanced and they're not that good. They're, they're shaking all over the place. There's a lot of jelly out there and it's rolling around when you're moving it in the wind. This one looks like it's got a three axis stabilization system and it's that good. So anyway, that's the bottom line and that's why you're limited to a 4K video here and only 1080p here is because that extra space on the sensor that would provide the additional image to get you to 4K is being reserved back for that digital image stabilization. So that's kind of the conclusion I came to. So 
Just a couple of final thoughts. So all the conversation I had today around this technology and the conclusions I arrived at were based on publicly available information. I don't have any inside track with DJI or access to their manuals or any contacts in engineering that I can ping for this information, although I wish I did. I'm lucky enough to be invited to a few of their launch events and I really appreciate that insight. I wish I could establish some engineering contact with those guys. Maybe someday down the road I will. But for now, my conclusion is the reason that the Spark can only record 1080p video is obviously because it's got stabilized mechanical gimbal control in two directions, and by lacking that third dimension of control in the yaw dimension, it has to have some kind of digital image stabilization layered on top of the mechanical. And to do that, like I mentioned, they have to shrink that image sensor a little bit. They can't use the full image sensor. So that's the reasoning behind it. Honestly, that's not something they can fix. That's something that's built into the actual technology. Having said that, the 1080p on this one is not a limiting factor for me. These two quads were designed to do different things, and I've got a whole clip coming that explains the differences between them, but essentially this is a full-featured quad. This is more for an entry-level quad or for something that's for daily use that you want to quickly put up a quad or a camera in the air to capture that perfect scene or that sunset or even that perfect selfie, and it does everything it should do in that space. So I fly both of these almost on a regular basis every day, and I love them both for different reasons, but this is fast becoming my favorite quad that I own because of the versatility, the portability, and really the price. I mean, you can't beat it. When you think of the amount of technology that's packed into that tiny little package there, you've got this flying robot with telemetry, optics, stabilization. It's just an incredibly cool quad. And to take a quad like that and put a cell phone level camera, a 1080p camera up in the air, 400 feet, and fly it a mile away, uh, that's space age stuff to me, so I love it. So anyway, that's all I really had for today. I hope you found this helpful. I like doing these kind of investigative things because I really like to stretch my brain a little bit around the engineering of it and try to come to some conclusions. So hopefully you've enjoyed the clip. If you have any questions about what I've talked about, drop them in the comments below. I'll do my best to get back to you, I promise. Um, and again, I really enjoy doing these clips. As long as you guys are having fun watching them and you're finding value in them, I'll continue to do them. I really appreciate the viewership. I can see the subscription numbers going up almost every day, and that's a really Really good thing for me because that means we're doing something right and you guys are giving me plenty of inspiration to continue to put these clips out. So anyway, thanks again for watching and until next time, happy flying.